so th this um, this is another word the Lord gave me last night, and um, I'm a little shaken by it. I'm just I'm a little shaken by it, and uh, I want to be able I want to be able to be I want to revere this word. So. I'm just going to begin it. I don't know what else to say. Um, it actually is, uh, it does tie into yesterday when we were talking about, so what, what church is fitting for the Son of God? Uh, what, what I mean, how is church supposed to, the church that looks like it's inspired by the Son of God, what, that's, what is that supposed to look like? The church that's inspired by the Son of God, not man's idea, we need to build, we need to build a church here, but by the inspiration, the, the spirit, breath, what, what is that supposed to look like? And it's supposed to look like people who are inspired by the Son of God. They are inspired by the Son of God. I mean, deeply inspired. That inspiration compels them to offer deep homage and reverence to the Lord who has come for them. The one who has come to bring us into his family. And so... So deep is this reverence. It's to the point where we want to offer up our entire lives up to the Lord. To revere and honor him above, before anything else. There's like no competitor in the arena of what should be esteemed. Because we've seen God. When you've seen God, when you've heard God, when God makes himself known, you have a divine perspective. And you see life differently, deeply differently. You, you don't see the church anymore as some kind of co-op where we can encourage each other until we die. But it's actually a habitation of God himself because we're, we're the body of Christ. We're not the corpse of Christ. We're the body of Christ. His life is within us. So these people, us, and, and it is us, but as I shared last night, I'm sharing these things to encourage us in our courage, to have a greater acuity to perceive what has been entrusted to us so that it can be our culture and our way. And the way begins with seeing rightly. You cannot walk the way in darkness. Like at the beginning of Luke, it talks about how in the Annunciation of the Incarnation that Mary declares that now those who are in darkness have seen a great light. And it's not the sun. It's not the beams of a star. It's, it's the uncreated light of God. And, you, and you, you come to this awareness. Where I was thinking about life before, well, that's total and complete darkness compared to what I see now. Because <laughs> I see before me the arms of God and the hands of God that brought me into existence. 
So the church, the assembly, the gathering of those who are gathered around the shepherd, the flock of God is compelled and brought because of their hearts have been touched by his heart. They're compelled to be all in. That is, everything that is, constitutes their life now, all of that they want to be in the hands of God. They're holding nothing back because God has revealed himself to them. Because they know that to hold back is a great dishonor. And they don't want to dishonor the one who so honored them that he has come in the fullness of humanity. Not as a caricature, not even simply as a scroll that fell down from heaven, but he's personally come to articulate a message that has to be in his person because it's so deep into his heart that he wants to communicate his person to his people. Not ideas, not rules or, or, or a schematic diagram of a template of how we're supposed to live, but he wants to communicate and open up doors for us to be able to know, this is what church is for, to know how to live with him. How to live with him now. Because he can't wait to later. His love doesn't wait. His love is now given over to his people now. He loves them now. The eternal love in heaven is the love on earth now. And that's what the church is for. To give a revelation of how, what that looks like in the lives of those whom he's made and remade in his image and likeness. Because of this, because we know who Jesus is, and we know that church is all about Jesus, living with Jesus, receiving Jesus, that we want his word. We want him to live within us. And we want to be all alive in him. And so that's why he speaks his word. And the word of God, as, as Jesus speaks about it, the word is, is seed. You know, in seed there's life, and there's a potential for greater life in the seed. And so in God's word, there is life. In the word, in the seed, there's, there's a promise for life, and it's all engineered to give up life. Jesus is saying his word's like that. His word is able to communicate, able to communicate his heart and his life. So there's a transfer from his heart into ours through the seed, through the word. So for us, the word, no, is not academic study. It's not information. It's not like that at all. It's a communication of himself so that when it lands in our hearts, we have life that we didn't have before. And it's the design of God. He shares his word with us so that we could together share the same life. See, it's living with, the church is living like God, living with God, and we're able to do this because he throws out his seed, these packets of grace, these packets of life, these expressions of love, like, 
I really want to merge my love with your love. And I want, I want to share my life with you. So it's appropriate to look at it this way. The church is to be a place where the seed is, is sown by the sower. And the sower has a confidence. Unlike maybe what it would be like in the world, he has a confidence that his trust is going to be returned. He's going to throw out seed. And this seed, brothers and sisters, I know it's an inanimate object, so we don't quite get this. But, but I think it's appropriate if in some ways we look at the sexual analogy around seed. There's something about life and intimacy in giving the seed. And the seed, God wants to germinate in, in us. He wants, to, he wants to inseminate us. And you cannot be inseminated unless you're thinking something bizarre and unnatural. You can't be inseminated the way it's supposed to be, happen through mechanical means. It comes through closeness. It comes through embrace. It comes through love. The seed comes through love. And we receive the seed in love. If we receive the seed as a thing, as an idea, as a philosophy, as a rule, then there will be no insemination. Let me extend the analogy that is a metaphor. If I speak to my wife and I say, let's do this biological experiment tonight and see if insemination creates a child. That's not going to happen. Because she will rightly think, I'm being used to, to have something else happen to me for a product. If you talk about insemination, or, in, or this germination that is to happen in the womb, as if it's simply a biological fact, as if it isn't something about an expression of love, of giving and receiving, then that's not going to happen. Isn't that right? Even in the normal order of things, sure, people could be motivated by lust, or they could be using one another. Yes, that's a false, that's a false way of approaching the whole matter. But the way that it has been designed by God from the very beginning of time, it's supposed to be an expression of great intimacy and great trust, and there's supposed to be something that happens in that union where a whole experience of life flourishes that could not have happened otherwise. So the people of God want to be impregnated with the word of God. They want the word to grow in them. So that it begets life. So it's able to reproduce. So they're going to do this. They're going to treat the word with reverence. When the word is coming their way, and they know it's the word of God, brothers and sisters, do you hear the word of God right now? Do you hear that this is more than words that's coming at you? That there's something about the Holy Spirit right now speaking to you? Do you discern this as something greater than, an, uh, than, a, than rhetoric or, or just giving a sermon? Do you sense right now as I do that there's something larger than just humanity here in this moment and that the Lord himself is trying to reach out and reach out into the womb of our hearts, if I can mix this metaphor, so that he can implant something so that we would be able to have a reverence for the life he wants to offer us and we'd be able to receive it in such a way that it would be get a life in us where we'd look like we have seen God yet more. Because that's what the Lord wants to do. So right now he's casting out seed. So 
So we know that the seed is coming in us, so we're thinking, how can I take care that I don't miscarry? They don't just treat it like a word, something I'll forget later. Like, it, like if it was just something mechanical. Or, you know, I heard words, I've read a menu, of, I've read books, and this is more words. How, how can it be lifted out from that? Well, the way that you know it's lifted out from that, by the way you take care of it. You know it's the Word of God, and you, you hold the Word of God. And you say, Lord, I understand what you're asking when you offer me this word. You're trusting me. You're trusting me to care for something very intimate and very important. A way that you want to reveal yourself to me. So I'm going to take this word, Lord, and I'm going to, by grace, I'm going to put it in my heart and it'll be a heart issue for me. It's a heart issue for me. I'm here, Lord. I'm in your church because you've compelled me to respond to your love with all that I am. And now you honor me by wanting to continue to share your life with me. And that's through your word, the word that we're receiving right now. And we're saying, Lord, I don't want to forget this word and make it words. I want it to be get life the way that you gave it to me. That was your intention from the very beginning. The seed is sown with the, with the hope that it will indeed bear fruit and bring life. And I know that. So Lord, I'm going to take special reverence. You know, sometimes we, well, we do. We, in a way that we handle the sacrament of the Eucharist in a special way, we make sure that it's also all consumed at the end. We don't throw it out, you know, but because it's a symbol of the presence of Christ. You don't just treat it as common. The word of God's like that. You can't just treat it as common words. Like I was already inferring, it's not just oratory. This is possible revelation. But it all depends how it's received, whether it can give birth to a deeper revelation of the love and the grace, the mercy and the kindness of God. So we, we, don't, we don't want to handle it just like words. Because see, it begins with awe with who the Lord is. He's shown us himself. We said, now that I've seen you, my life is not going to be lived for something less than you. I'm not even going to share other parts of my life with anyone else but you. The heart of my heart is given to you. I may do other things, but my devotion is to the one who's most devoted to me. That's you. So Lord, you've given me your word. I don't want a stillbirth. I don't want, I don't, I don't want to treat this uh, as if it were common. And uh, we, we can use the analogy. So and this is important. Maybe this will help at least some ladies who have who've had uh, ch children by, you know, by birth and they uh, when they're going to be a mother, and, and we're assuming they have a good marriage, you know, the, that, this, that they've, been in, they've been impregnated by a man they know who loves her. This couple is very excited about the life, the potential life that they're going to be able to share. When this child comes to t full term, even though the woman has a particular bond for, for this child in her womb, there's an intensity of, 
affection for the husband as well. That didn't quite exist the same way before, though it might have been there, but now something is happening where these things are drawn into a sharper relief, and in that moment, there's a revelation of the nature of the relationship that was different than it was before. So the woman takes care of this child in her womb. She knows that this is a shared life. She didn't do this on her own. So she's not going to pick up smoking, and she's not going to start doing shots of vodka, right? She's not going to, she's not going to just be eating uh, excessively. She's not going to be uh, picking up, like I said, I don't know if I said picking up smoking or whatever. She's not going to be taking drugs because she's thinking, I've got a life inside of me, and I want that child to be healthy. I want to protect that child. Because I love my husband, and, and we together love this life. And so when she's taking care of that child, she's also expressing her love and honor to her husband as well. So she does things that she wouldn't do otherwise. She'll start reading books, right? She'll start reading all she can to make sure that this baby is a healthy baby. It's not because all of a sudden she just took an academic interest in the subject. It's a love-motivated study, right? She takes these large vitamins that she wouldn't have thought of to take before because she cares about the health of the child. She's going to do some things different. Whatever she's told to do to ensure to protect that baby in the womb and to ensure that the child comes to term, the mother is going to take care of that child. She comes to a point where if even it must be that she has to give up her life for the child, she'd be willing to do that already even though she's never seen that child's face. That's called love. And it's inspired by God. It's natural, but it's inspired by God. He's the author of it nonetheless. <coughs> because that woman wants this child to sprout. Going back to the seed, wants this child to flourish. And you know, it won't happen unless there's that, not that kind of care. At least she doesn't think it will, and she's just certainly not going to take any chances. Is that communicating something about how the Lord views his word to us? There was a prayer, and it was a good prayer. It was a right prayer. And it's true that we trust the Lord for his church. But do we understand that in this seed, he's saying to you and me, I trust you for my church. because I love you. I'm going to give you life. I'll give you everything you need. But I'm trusting you with my life. That is awesome. That's just, what kind of love is that? It certainly deserves to be honored. We're talking more than, more than just a, like a flush of affection here. We're talking about a deep, a happy love, a deep, a deep hesed love, covenant love. You know, the word hesed actually is hesed and agape. I've, I've, I've sent you uh, two PDFs about studying that subject to help fill out this understanding that what the Lord is about with us. We talked about last week, we talked about covenant. And covenant establishes relationships. And this covenant that we have with God is a love covenant establishing a marriage relationship, a union relationship. 
Now, Hesed love is a bit different than agape, but they both, are, they both have their due, and you've got to put them together to get the whole picture. We know that agape is unconditional sacrificial love. But in this covenant love, this Hesed love, there's another dimension that sometimes is overlooked, but definitely complements agape. It is the obligations of marriage kind of love. That is, well, let me put it this way. Two people who are married, they're a lot different than two people who are living together, right? On the outward, it might look exactly the same, maybe, if you were just kind of, they lived across the street from you. They're both living together. Maybe they have a child, but there's something missing. But if you talk to them and say, why are you two together? Well, we just love each other. But it's not Hesed love. It's love based on self-interest. Because once the self-interest is gone, that marriage, quote unquote, is not going to last. And people get confused. Because when you put words like obligation or duty or responsibility in love, people almost, especially in this culture, like, ooh, I don't think I want to do that. But if you have a marriage relationship, it is a relationship styled after how God understands love, which is, I love you so much, I'm going to give you a responsibility for our relationship together so that you'll never have to wonder whether you loved me back or not. I'm going to treat you by grace almost like an equal, though you're not. Because I'm going to set the pitch for the relationship. But I'm going to tell you what love really is. And love is responsible. Right. Love values the relationship in such a way where you care for the other even if it causes you pain. Genuine love is like that. I know there's lots of stories when there's the husband in church, or the bride, excuse me, the, I should say the groom at church. He's there you know, at the altar, and here comes the bride, and numbers, number, numbers of husbands are nervous. You know, oh, I don't know if I'm, what I'm getting into. I'm only saying this analogy to help, under, help you understand the nature of Hesed. But when it comes to time, if I can say this, when my daughter, when someone comes for my, the hand of my daughter, I'm going to ask him, tell me why that she will love God more with a greater maturity because she married you than someone else. And if he says, that's a good question, I have to think about it. I said, take a long time, because I'm not going to discuss it now. Because this should have been thought through way before. The point of that analogy is, because you're entering into a relationship with God, with my daughter. In any marriage relationship, it's supposed to be understood. You're entering in this relationship through the covenant that God has given first himself to you. So part of, so God is going to want to give us his seed. And so in that, there is an obligation to honor him. And we say, thank you for filling that out for me, because now my love for you is going to be purer than it was before. Thank you, Father, for explaining that to me. So now I can actually have a greater expression and experience of union with you than, I, than if I had my own ideas about marriage first. But now you're telling me what it's supposed to look like. That is going to shape my life, Father. Thank you. Isn't that beautiful?
so when we receive the word of God, like right now, we've got to view it as a, a great, great treasure. Because now we understand that it's not just mere instruction and now, now where's the application? But we're talking about an experiential potential revelation of union that will continue to shape our lives. Right? Love can shape our lives. This kind of love can change us. The word of God, you know how you know that you've received the word of God? You're different than the way you were before. No different? Then receive it. Really, I mean, I'm not trying to be dramatic. It's not a dramatic flair. It's just the word of God has life in it. I know we want that life to be in us. I know we do. But I don't know if we think that it really does have our part to it that we have to really take care of it. If we know we're hearing it, then what it means is love looks like honor in that moment and that we will not let the birds eat our seed. We will not take the word in just for an experience. Whoa, that was wonderful. That was like a great one night stand. You know, that was a wonderful experience. My whole body's shaking. But there's just a, just a veneer of earth so that it's not really sinking in. So that when there's a time when the marriage is on the line, when our witness and identification with the Father, with His Son, and the Spirit of God is on the line, and someone says to us, if you continue that, I'm going to reject you. And I'm going to make your, your life very miserable that we don't say, forget it, forget it. I, I, sure, um, you know, God, I know God understands. Forget it, forget it. We're not going to do that. When persecution comes, we think, my goodness, this is the opportunity to show that this love we're talking about is divine love. This intimacy is larger than just with, between two human people. This is larger than a human psychology of love and emotion. This is powerful love that sits forever in heaven unshaken, and it re reflects the very character of God. We're talking about something extremely holy that deserves a sacred obedience and reverence and submission. Isn't that right? So the church is the place where the Lord has said, you know, you're going to be like my disciples. I'm going to give you mysteries that other people just couldn't get because you've already said, Lord, I am in awe of you. I have, you've compelled me to give up everything I am to you. Yes, I receive your covenant, your way. Your understanding of love will be revered and honored because my heart's desire is to give my greatest honor to you. No one else. My flesh will not even have a seat at the table. So when we hear the word of God, we have to understand something. To receive the word of God, this has got to be more than interesting to us. <laughs> like, hey, this is life or death for me. So, like, like a disciple with the master. You know, disciples are very attentive to their master. So a disciple wants to follow this master. Why? He wants to become just like him. He wants to know what he knows. And he wants to enter into the life that the master has that they don't have yet. So when he speaks, they're like this. 
straight on laser beam. They're not just listening while doing something else. They're looking at the facial expression. Is my master worried about this? Does he find joy in this? The way he's looking right now, is he really wanting me to get something that he think I might not get? I, might, I have to get ready with questions. How is he gesturing? I mean, really. I mean, and these things are not just, again, to extend it out. I mean, they, they just are so focused. So if there's a big commotion, somebody's like having problems with their camel or whatever, or their net someplace, and they're yelling, they're not going to pay any attention to that. They're going to say, what's going on there? They're not going to be doing that because they're with their master. And they also know that there is a covenant. There is such a thing, a covenant between master and rabbi. And they have that. And it's like, I'm yours. I belong to your school, which was not just a school, brothers and sisters, a whole way of life. I, be I, I belong to you. And I'm loyal to you. That's the church with Jesus. You want to know what church is? I'm explaining church in all of this. That's the church of the New Testament. That's the God-breathed church. Don't you want to be that church? Yes. We are. But brothers and sisters, the way that we grow into it yet more, does, did, we must ask ourselves the question, is there a way I could honor the word more? Is there a way that I could receive it? As I was studying this parable, numbers of commentators said, those who were committed to obey what was said ahead of time, always got the understanding of what he was talking about. And they didn't forget because they knew, this is important, what isn't lived is forgotten. What isn't lived is forgotten. Whatever is not germinated and becoming a part of who you are is going to be forgotten. It's not going to be learned again when you review your notes. See, this is seed. These aren't just words. So if you want to plant something and you want to see something come from it like life, you don't make sure that when you get the seed, you put it in a jar and you put it on a bookshelf with your notebook. The seed does not belong there. The seed belongs in soil that has first been ripped apart so that the deep part of the soil is exposed so that when it falls in that place, it has a home and can grow. Many Christians don't know that. I think I need to, I, I need to get, get in the word. I, I need to know the word, the word better. I, I need to be reading more of the word. You know what? If it's not, if the soil isn't prepared, you can take a whole dump truck of seed on that spot and nothing is really going to grow. There might be all those signs of life here and there for a moment or two, but it's just not going to grow. It's supposed to be deep down. When we're talking about the word, if we understand this, correctly. you got to be exposed. I'm going to repent. I'm going to repent deep. There's things in my life that I know are an obstacle for me receiving the word, and I'm going to have to humble myself to this person or to all those people. I'm going to have to be able to move past my fear and my comfort zone and my security, because now I'm saying my security is to make sure I don't miscarry. The love that God has given to me, I'm going to treasure that more than what's going on in that life it has nothing to do with this seed that the Lord wants to entrust to me. So I'm going to say, I'm going to be wide open. I'm 
I'm not going to hold back, right? That's what we said at the beginning, so that this seed can't have its way in me. Did you know there's no safe way of really having the seed? You can't, you can't, you can't hold the seed without great risk. It means you are going to be losing something to have a life. Just like if people are going to have a child, they know, don't they? In some ways, they learn better afterwards, but they know that some things about their life is going to change. If they continue on as if they didn't have a child, they are going to have a rebellious child or simply a dead child because that child is either going to commit suicide or run away, but it's not going to be the way it was all intended. Do we think that in the natural, that has a lot higher le lesson for us than in the spiritual? No, it's the exact opposite. This is more true in the things of the spirit than it is in the natural. You're going to have to give up lots of stuff to receive life. You're going to have to give over your warmed, warmed over death life for genuine life that pulsates through you, that can beget life so that when that child is born, that child is in this environment of love. That child is going to reproduce himself or herself because that's a healthy child. Well, God is saying to us, you're my children. And I want you to be like me. My son, as it says in Hebrews, obeyed me even though at times he had to wail with tears to be obedient to me. But later it also said in Hebrews it was a joy for him considering, considering his relationship with the Father and those whom the Father loved and all those that he loved. Brothers and sisters, the church is supposed to give that revelation to the world. The only safety is love responding to love. Yeah. So I was torn about whether I should do this or not, but now I've decided I will. Prophetically, I'm going to do this. So today, you've heard the word of the Lord. <laughs> and seed is here, right? Here's what I'm saying. What are you going to do with it? What will you do with the seed? Are you going to review your notes? Don't do that. What will you do with the seed? I'm thinking maybe you'll take one of these and put them in your pocket. Then put it on your altar to remind you that the Lord is trusting you for the life that he wants to give you each moment that you hear his word spoken. But the only way that's going to work if it's love responding to love. And if you understand that it's actually the Lord being very vulnerable when he gives his word to us. So, so we can be vulnerable. So when you think about the word, what is it going to cost? How will you care for it? Like this word today. I'm not going to replay the sermon next week. It's kind of like we're done. Or for you, you might think, well, I'm, I'm not done. In fact, now as I hear this, I've begun in a whole new way. I will not reckon the word of God as if it was just ideas passed on from one person to another. As I've said, brothers and sisters, the church is not me. It's you and me together. And it's not sermons. It's a way of life with God.
So what will we do with this? I mean, really, take a moment. And I'm not asking for a response. No, I have a question. Okay, yeah, we'll wait for later. But, I mean, what would you do with this word and every word that you hear? I'll tell you how it affects me, personally. It affects me this way. Lord, I know you are a Lord of grace, and I know that you love me, and that's why you speak to me. And I know that I'm not appropriately responding to your word the way I want to. But God, I want to. I really, really want to. And so, Lord, you have permission, and I'm asking you that you'd reshape my life so I could be ready for the word. So I'd be prepared, prepared ahead of time when I know the word is, is going to be spoken to me or when I'm going to be, be with you in prayer or, or just throughout the whole day to be open to hear your voice. Lord, I want you to begin to do a work in me where first off, and I'll talk more about this next week, but I, first off, that I desire the word so, so much that there's a pain in my heart. I desire the word the way you want me to receive it more than anything. Because the truth is, our lives are shaped by what we most desire. And if there are desires, whether it be for security or uh, understanding or respect, or if there are other desires that get in the way of germination, that cause difficulty for me to carry this baby, I want you to tell me that. Oh, please tell me this. Please tell me this. Because I want to be, I want to be even more overcome by your love than I am now. And I know because of your love for me, I have something to do with how I receive your word. So Lord, I'm asking for grace I'm not asking it as one request behind numbers of others, but as a chief request, I'm asking for a greater desire of your word that's appropriate to the revelation of your love for me and your love for everyone. Help me, Lord. This is too large for me. And I don't want it to make sense apart from revelation. So what will we do with this word? I throw out the seeds just thinking, if you forget everything, because I know people, if you forget everything, you'll say, remember that time you threw out seeds? Then hopefully you'll think, remember what that was about at that time? I know next week, I won't have to say, do you remember what I talked about last, next week, you know, last week? But that's not the point of the memory link. <laughs> the point is, I'm going to hear the word of God next week. Or I'm going to be hearing it tomorrow, if I want to. <clears throat> Lord, help me to want this more than any other want that I have, because I do know who you are. 
and I want to honor you with my love. So I haven't read the parable, but I put it in your outlines. And of course, it's in the scriptures. You can read Mark 4. But why don't you pray that this week? You know, it is an amazing parable. Because Jesus said to his disciples, if you don't understand this, how are you going to understand anything? I don't think there's a lot of deep understanding in the Western church today. And it's not because they don't have Bibles, and it's not because they haven't heard sermons, but it does have something to do with reverence for the covenant love of God and for them not really seeing the Lord for who he truly is. So they view these, this very deep expression of life that God wants to beget in us as just something that they could take or leave. Well, we can all change that way. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us even right now around that. Put on your prayer heart. Receive what I'm going to pray and pray in the deep parts of your being with me. Holy Father, we thank you that we can call you Father just like was prayed today. That you are our Father. Thank you for your precious Son. At great cost, you gave us your Son. At great cost, Jesus, you laid down your life. Precious Holy Spirit, at great cost, you have united yourself to us for all eternity. Lord, we want to be the church that reveals who you are, that treasures your love as the greatest treasure possible, which it is. Lord, protect the seed. Help us to pray bold prayers in faith. Do what you must to teach us what's necessary to cut deep into the ground of our hearts. That would move patterns and habits, misunderstandings and fears. They'd all move away to make space for your seed. Lord, we are encouraged even today that you would speak this word to us because of your love. Again, you give us a testimony of, of your commitment to us and how much we mean to you. Lord, may your church reflect how much you mean to us that others be drawn by the witness of this otherworldly love that you've planted in us. Lord, increase our desire for what you desire for us. Lord, by your grace, we ask that you help us to enter into a higher reverence and a way of honoring you that we've never, ever done before. Because certainly you have honored us. Certainly you have honored us. Thank you, Lord. Every time you speak these words, you give us encouragement because they could pretend that we will listen and that we will respond and that we will be drawn closer to you and closer to one another as your true family. Lord, we know that you are merciful, but our hearts still want to ask for forgiveness 
for any ways that we have treated your word in a way that had been dishonoring. Lord, we know that we will do this again, but again, let it be said from our hearts, we don't want to do that. So, Lord, guide us by the hand and lead us by the heart into a deeper relationship with you that we might be that city set on a hill that, like your son, we would be the light of the world and that we would testify that God has not left his people, but he walks among them and that he lives with them. That's what we desire. That's what we know you desire. And, Father, you believe in us we believe in you. We believe you can do this in us and among us because love and trust always go together. We know that you trust us because you love us. Father, we trust you because we love you. Thank you, Lord, that we meet there and now we have great hope, expectancy of the good because you already are teaching us the ways of the kingdom and what it means to live under your governess, God. So we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you. Can we just put something on worship for a moment? Um, And then we can discuss a bit, but I want us still to be in the presence of the Lord a bit and not, that's one of the things that too, to revere the word of God, you can't rush from one thing to the next. So let's just be in his presence a bit longer. It can be something we just listen to, too, Ethan, if that's more helpful, whatever. It's just a symbol of our offering ourselves to him and his word.
for you. you, Lord. Oh, yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Worthy of you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. My God, I will build my life upon your life. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust 
in you are love, and I will not be shaken. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Blessed be your name forever, Lord God. Glory to you, mighty God. So be it, O Lord. Worthy, worthy are you, Lord. Thank you, O Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Holy are you, God. Worthy are you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. It's just good to know sometimes that the Lord does things inside of us that are beyond all understanding. We don't have to understand everything or maybe that much. He's always talking about the attitude and disposition of hearts. That's something everyone can understand and that's really the big the big thing. That song was perfect. <laughs> perfect. Well, are there anything that you want to say or ask about that you think is pertinent? Yeah. Determined to So, as I was praying around last night and, and what you were starting your sermon with was around why are people, how did you answer, how did you ask the question, why are people not interested in the church or something like that? I was seeking the Lord about, you know, how to talk to people about the church. Right. And, uh, and then I thought, well, do people know what the point of the church what is? What the point of the church is. And, and that's a question they ask in, the, in a kind of a cynical way, you right. know, what's the point? But then I was musing before God, you know, what is the point of your church? Right. And then receive the revelation, well, the confusion isn't about the church. Mm -hmm. The confusion is a dullness and an unawareness about the majesty and the beauty of God in Christ. Yeah. So right. the questions that are asked about the church are actually about an entirely different subject right. than how the Lord sees the church, which right. is where Jesus is to be reigning. And, yeah. and that is sort of leading me to, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking, well, what are the, what are the other reasons that people would not be interested? And I'm thinking there are those who have been traumatized by their life in the church. There are those who have, you know, sought the Lord and been left without. And, and we would even, we could say, that's not Jesus. That's not the church. Um, or even you misunderstand or you're, you're doing this. And so I just know that there are people, when you're using the analogy of a husband and a wife, there are those who are 
terrified of being vulnerable with Jesus because they have encountered someone who's not Jesus. They have had to deal with uh, people who are not the church. And, and so as I'm thinking around this, and I'm, I'm thinking of people in particular who I'm, who I'm praying for, it's just like how, how are we to come before the Lord and you're saying just open up completely and that's, that's a work that the Lord does of making us vulnerable you know, he's the one who, who plows up the soil. And it's our responsibility to be open to him. But what of those who are just Well, we asked him to rip up the soil. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, and so that's, the, that's the question that I'm having is he only reveals himself to those who consent to his invitation. It's, it, he, he only he comes with permission. Even his invitation to follow him is... Well, let me, open to let me interrupt it because I know we don't have much time. Thank you. So I'll just yeah. take a point of what you're saying. Yeah, I think you understand the <clears throat> yeah. question I'm asking. So. I think one of the things that, which is what you said, I'm sure numbers of people will be nodding their heads everywhere, whoever sees this. Uh, he totally understands where I'm coming from. Um, but I think what people don't see is, um, I think people still think trauma is larger than the revelation of God. I think they think their trauma trumps God having it, to be able to do what he had needs to do with me. It's that's just, it that's, yes, but I'm saying that we don't realize that in the culture that Jesus lived, people have trauma at such a high level that we can't imagine that what they live through, the mortality rate was very, very low and the kinds of abuse they had, how they treated children, how they treated their wives, how the government just uh, dominated people in such a way that was extremely abusive, slavery, that, that isn't like, I mean, uh, of a kind that is like they're, they're in going into the salt mines. And they're, I mean, these things are so commonplace in that time where almost everyone is below, way below our poverty level. And so they really literally had to say, you know, will I get bread today? Well, Jesus said, just pray for bread today. I mean, I'm just saying we have so contextualized the scripture based on our experience of trauma and our interpretation of what is a big deal that the word of God does not stand for the power and the might of God that it is. So we have to tell people, you got it wrong. And you're saying, well, no, you misunderstand me. No, you misunderstand. Because I'm talking about the word of God now, not your psychology. When does the word of God stand as the word of God? I don't know how Peter was raised, or James, or John. I don't know how they were raised. I know the trauma they experienced afterwards because they're following Jesus, and they still stood steadfast. I know that, that they, I mean, we don't know anything about their parents, you know. <laughs> we just know they said yes to Jesus. Broken people can say yes to Jesus and abandon everything and follow him. And that's what we need to call people to think. Do not give your trauma greater reverence than God himself or else it will never be broken over you. And that's, and that's my question because it is, I'm trying to think of how do I say that? Because it is the word of the Lord to say like, I'll just say what I said. Exactly. And I, it's like, I want to be patient. I want to be kind. But at some point, you have to, it's, it's sort of like, be the man. It, well, the I don't Lord. know how that's not extreme kindness or patience. Exactly. To say, like, this is. See, in this culture, it would be viewed Lord. as being impatient and unkind. No, no, no. But no what, it's not. Just to clarify, no. what Go I'm ahead. saying is, everything you're saying, I agree with. And the problem is that we are not the only church, quote unquote, in town. And, and so it's like coming to them in their terror to say, you must see Jesus. You have to see him. Can you trust him a little bit to meet you there? And I'm, and I'm trying to think, is that where I want to begin with, with people in, who are in their own, the trauma is real, even if it's misplaced. I, but see, I think what we forget is the word of God is incarnated in people. In people. If you said, let me show you my people. 
That's it. Who have trauma stories much greater than yours. Yeah. And who but see the see who God is, and they have triumphed over that because yeah. His love is perfect, and it does cast out all fear. They'll show you that the scriptures are true. And that's, and that's what the Lord to, is yeah. waiting for a people to say, yes. take me at my word. Yes. Just treasure it, though. Treasure it higher than any of your other experiences that would seek to counter it, and I will show you my power in your weakness. It's not that they have to be all of a sudden strong. No, that's give God a chance to show his power through your weakness by not acting like your weakness is too strong for God to break so that you could come into a whole different way of having life than you have forfeited up till now. And that's where we have to come and say, we are, look at our life. Exactly. And that's, that's the witness. So right. the witness is, how do we bring people to see Jesus? We bring them into our life. Right. So it's like, let me show you who Jesus is. The power of because testimony. Because you do not, you have forgotten or you've seen, you know, it's like you have been lied to. You have been lied to. Here's the truth. Right. And that's our responsibility to, to trust, for, to, to, rev, to revere him, is, uh, is through being who he's asked us to be. We're called to be sons of light, it says in Ephesians. Yes. You know, if you're light, you don't have to battle darkness. It just goes away. So the, the call is to be light. And uh, so we don't have to know the right words. We just have to be able to honor the word God has given to us. Yeah. And that testimony will cut through, cut through all resistance, and that's how that's why how the church is to be his sword, you know that his word, cutting through the darkness, you know, and freeing people. Thank you so for your question. I want to say one thing. I know it's time, but we can also say to people, "I understand that. I'm familiar with that. I can walk through that with you. If you want to do that, let's do that." And brothers and sisters, that's what we got to do. That's where we love and we just, and you will suffer and it will be hard and you'll have some hard conversations, but you know, that's just what we got to do. So this is something that we are prepared ahead of time to obey. We're already, our heart is already there that we're willing to do that. And then we can be a bridge and if people have one or two bridges, then you can bring them into the assembly, and then yeah. things just open up. Things yeah. just happen. But we have to be prepared to just have that confidence and say to people, I can see you through that. You know, I'll, I'll, well, I can show you how to connect with Jesus in such a way where we can go through that together. And then they can come and they can hear the they can hear hard words they can, but you know, well so a, it's like do uh, we want to do that? Well, no. Well, of course we yeah. want to do it because. Right. But I'm if just you're trying hold, to bring it well, down, like because yeah. people can't remember everything you're saying, they're well, not going to remember that kind of script. But we can. Well, they don't need to. Right. Like that's I'm saying, what I'm saying. Well, no. Here's why they don't need to. Yeah. The power of testimony. Right. That's all that's necessary. Yep. So you can forget that. I mean. I mean, the words are easy. It's like four right. words. But I'm just saying, I think sometimes we think that we, how we couch things is going to make the difference. And the thing is, how do we walk people through it? Because we've walked through that bridge ourselves. Exactly. We've yeah. learned how to value the word. When we value the word, we won't have to have someone tell us, remind us to say that to people. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because that life is inside of us. So yes, and we're going to love people, of course. So when we honor the word, we get all kinds of words and thoughts we never thought of before. That's really God's problem, and it's not a problem for him. It's, it's just what love looks like. The more loving we are, the wiser we are, the more empowered we are, and God gives his word to us so that we might be able to enter into that fellowship of love with him. And so... Um, like we've said many times before, the testimony of the early church isn't roving evangelists. It was, we alone know how to live. And that's our call. And we can't do that apart from the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. But we're not doing it for something other than we want to just honor God who's honored us. 
And so then he will lift up the light and draw people. And they'll come from all kinds of places. We don't have to try to figure it out. He'll just draw people to the light. That's what I believe. Amen. Amen.